Hi everybody, I'm Ruman, and today I will talk about three things, optical trapping, the Boltzmann's constant, and Brownian motion. The goal of the lab is to extract Boltzmann's constant out of Brownian motion, and there are two key components to think about. First one is the Boltzmann's constant, which is prevalent in different types of uh, science, for example, we can have it in biophysics where people use the Boltzmann's constant to try to understand forces in a cellular level. We have it in thermodynamics with the famous equipartition theorem. How does this relate to the Brownian motion? The key thing is to think about length scales. Brownian motion is relevant in terms of microns, and at the same time, if we look at a cellular level, for example, if we look at our hair, uh, we have micron-sized hair. All right, so there are different ways to measure the Boltzmann's constant. Some people uh, measure the speed of sound in argon gas. Others do optical trapping in air. We will do slightly different optical trapping, as you will see. But the consensus among the scientific community is that it is challenging. <laughs> Our plan is to prepare Brownian particles and control their Brownian motion. We take uh, glass beads, of, uh, they're spherical glass beads of a diameter of 3.2 microns. And the main tool is to concentrate a highly focused lasers on top of these beads. There's interesting physics going on. Light carries momentum, thus it generates force. We have that the net gradient force opposes the motion of the beam, while the net scattering force goes along the motion of the beam. And when these two forces um, balance each other, we have a bead that is at the center. When you push this bead a little bit to the left or to the right, then we have that the gradient forces are pulling it back in the center. And essentially, we observe a simple harmonic motion. Uh, in a more concrete example, what we did is we took samples and we confined everything into a two-dimensional plane. This is very important. We have two directions, the x direction and the y direction for the beads. We put them into water, and the source of Brownian motion comes from the collisions between our bead with the molecules into the water. These are thermal collisions that generate Brownian motion. As you can see, this lonely bead has its Brownian motion. What's interesting is when we shine light on top of a bead, we trap this bead and we can find the Brownian motion, so it's feasible to measure uh, the motion. And the theory behind this is very beautiful. It's uh, about the equipartition theorem, which relates the kinetic energy coming from the simple harmonic motion on the left-hand side with the thermal energy uh, due to the degrees of freedom. Now, let us recall that we have a two-dimensional confinement, so we have a direction in x and direction in y. So it means that in each of the directions, we have one degree of freedom, which is correlated with this equipartition theorem. Now, an interesting thing about the statistical motion of the molecules is that we have the simple harmonic motion. However, the things are moving into water, so there is a drag force that dominates, so we simplify the left-hand side. What is very interesting is the F factor which comes from the collisions between the bead with the molecules. This generates forcing and driving of the simple harmonic motion. I would like to point out one thing about the scales of the forces. We have piconewtons, which is relevant for optical trapping and for Brownian motion. Uh, this is the first observation that we did, and actually Einstein did this, this observation a long time ago. He observed the white noise. Essentially, the collisions, they generate uh, uncorrelated forcing, and we can think of it as uh, something that is not biased with any distribution, it's just uniform. As you can see on these slides, uh, we have the position uh, plotted in terms of time, and it uh, exhibits uh, a uniform uh, distribution of the spectrum. Another thing that I would like to point out is to look at this plot of uh, uh, fluctuations in X and Y and the power, which is uh, linear with the current of the lasers. As you can see, as the power becomes big, this means that we are trapping more, so we have less fluctuations, which is something as expected. All right, so let's figure out what we want to do with this lab. 
uh, we have the equipartition theorem and uh, essentially we have three components that we would like to measure in order to extract KB. We need to find the fluctuations, which I just presented to you. We need to find the uh, stiffness coefficient alpha, which is related to the spring constant of motion. And then we need to measure the temperature T. The apparatus that we use um, has two main components. The two components are concerned with the two types of light that we use in our experiment. We use a laser that shines on top of the confined two-dimensional samples and tries to trap a bead. The scatter light from the laser goes into a QPD, a quadrant photo detector, which is a neutral fast camera that manages to quickly digitalize the content and give us the position of the scattered light. So when we trap the bead, we know where it is by observing the feedback from the QPD. The other interesting uh, uh, part of the apparatus is the LED light, which illuminates the sample, and then it brings it to the CCD camera. And this is very important. So the CCD camera is very slow. It cannot measure Brownian motion. What it can do is it can tell us where are the beads. Uh, it can allow us to look at the water and like find the beads we want to trap. So these two components in, in combination are crucial for the success of our research. Um, there is interesting electronics coming behind this. Uh, essentially, um, the signals from the QPD and from the stage position where we put our sample are uh, uh, given in terms of volts. So a natural question that arises is uh, how are we going to uh, remember what is important? There are two important things that we like to keep track of two positions. The first one is the position of the stage that gives us a relative point of consideration. And the second one is the position of the QPD, which as you can recall, it measures the place of the bead that we have trapped. These uh, inputs are given in terms of volts. So the natural thing to do is to find a calibration that converts these volts into actual distances. Here you can see how we do this. We plot the stage X uh, position, you can, we can plot the stage Y, it's completely analogous to the, to the QPD positions here. And the conversion factor hides along these slopes here. Now, as you can see, we have two different slopes here with different absolute values. So this type of measurement is prone to errors. How we approach this problem is that we fault by choosing more data points and trying to increase the statistic thus hopefully reducing the systematics of this measurement. The second step is to start uh, getting the components that we need in order to extract KB, is to measure the stiffness coefficient alpha. Now the main idea is to take the equation of motion and to make a Fourier transform in order to get the positions in terms of frequencies. There is mathematics behind this and essentially the power spectral distribution and that's the distribution of this motion here that we expect obtains this form here from where we can extract the characteristic frequency F0. And F0 gives us alpha, which is what we really need. This is a log-log plot, as you can see here. Another thing I would like to mention is look at the proportionality here. As we increase the power, uh, we also increase the stiffness coefficient alpha because we trap more closely. So it means that F0 has to increase. And indeed, when we increase the power, we are shifting F0 to the right. Having all of these components, we can put this into the big picture. And the big picture is the extraction of KB over here. I showed you X squared, the fluctuations. I showed you alpha. We can measure the temperature T. And then we can get KB. The essence of this measurement is to look at the inverse proportionality between uh, fluctuations and uh, trap stiffness. Then we can make a fit with a reasonable chi-squared probability. And from here, we can extract KB. The result is presented on the slide. We also show you the measurement that we extract from literature. Uh, our result is within two sigma of the um, accepted value of KB. Actually, we're very close to one sigma from the accepted value of KB. What is driving this um, like unfortunate outcome? The thing that drives this unfortunate outcome is the systematic errors uh, on our picture. This is our uh, starting error 
this is the uncertainty in KB. And there are different factors that contributed to this. As you saw, the calibration is very difficult. We have error from the laser heating the water and changing the temperature. We have systematic error of the electronics, which we safely ignore uh, because the first two factors dominate this. Our electronics were very precise. And then we have the statistical uncertainties that we use, which correspond to some error propagating tricks. OK, now let's do our investigation. The first one is about the calibration. As you can see, uh, all of these slopes should be valid, but they're actually not. So what we do is we take them into account, we average them, then we take more data points, we average again, and then we propagate the errors in order to reduce the systematics. The second one is due to the heating of the laser. Essentially what happens is when the laser hits the water, it starts heating the vicinity. And this is unfortunate because, yes, we can measure the room temperature by using the thermometer, but the actual uncertainty on the temperature is much bigger because we have extra heating due to the laser. We try diligently uh, to, uh, to avoid this by moving the laser constantly so that it doesn't stay in one place and heat up a lot. But it's very hard to quantify how exactly it heats up the water. And the third one is, um, um, is concerned with our fit with um, uh, fluctuations in terms of the trap stiffness. Initially, when we did the fit we, with the PSD method, we get a probability of chi-squared equals zero. And then we quickly realized that essentially what we need to do is take into account the horizontal errors. And here what we do is we transform the horizontal errors into the vertical errors. And this thing we can do by using addi addition in quadrature and propagation of the errors which gave us a reasonable, realistic chi-squared of 0.33. Uh, in conclusion, I'll start with the limitations. Uh, as you saw, it's very hard to distinguish between systematic errors and statistical uncertainties. The reason for this is, as you saw, is that we are fighting with the systematics by introducing more statistics, and everything mixes up in the propagation of errors. Um, the second thing that was, is very difficult in this lab is that we need to move the laser constantly so one of, the, one of the people working on this lab has to keep track of where the laser is and whether you're trapping things that you may not want to trap. The third thing is to the need to find better ways of calibration. Uh, and there are people who are actively working on this, uh, uh, on this topic here. As you saw, the main uh, source of uh, error came from the calibration, actually. But the plus is, is that we can give a reasonable estimate to the Boltzmann constant. And at the same time, we can have a lot of fun while doing so. I would like to thank uh, uh, to my partner, Emma. And I think uh, collaboration is very important for JLab and more specifically for this particular experiment. This experiment is impossible to be done without uh, a partner uh, because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to uh, keep track of where you want to put the laser and also what is going on around the laser. While one of the people is moving the laser, the other one should be looking uh, looking at the CCD camera and like telling what's, where, where are we going on, like what are we actually trapping, like what do we want to avoid, like we don't want these guys in our picture. I would also like to thank um, uh, the staff of this class for their uh, useful feedback and uh, their valuable help and finally for your attention. Uh, yeah, so we have a plot of, uh, this should be trap stiffness uh, versus uh, the, this is the current. And here, uh, actually I haven't uh, shown that it's, like the trap stiffness differs whether you look in the x direction or the y, the y direction. The actual measurements are analogous because the mathematics is the same. But as you can see here, we have different data points for the two cases. Uh, we account this into our considerations, yes. Yes? Yeah, so, so you mentioned earlier that like, we lost the trapping in the air or in the mm -hmm. water. Is there any benefit or like, what's the significance of the other half? 
Well, I mean, uh, the air uh, case, uh, well, I mean, everything boils down to this, uh, this consideration here. Uh, let me just, uh, okay, let, let me just find my explanation. It boils down to the, the viscosity that dominates. Um, so in our case, we have the viscosity of water that dominates. Uh, when you look in different mediums, you might have different types of viscosities which would change the motions. Uh, so I have the paper. Uh, I, I didn't actually read through the whole uh, details of, the, of how exactly the mathematics changes. Probably it does. Also, probably another issue that, are, that may not arise or may arise is the laser. Like in this case, like laser like heats up the, uh, the water. But I don't know how exactly the laser would uh, react with the air. Maybe it's going to heat up a little bit, but how is this heat like, going to be distributed in space? I'm not very knowledgeable of this as of now. So the equipartition theorem, it breaks into components. Uh, it breaks into the component of x, where you have one degree of freedom, and it breaks into the component of y, where you have another degree of freedom. Each of these considerations is concerned only within one uh, movement. So you have two degrees of freedom for the So for the... Okay, well, you can think about it in this way. We have two degrees of uh, freedom in total, but in the actual directions that are useful for our considerations, we have only one degree of freedom. So, uh, yeah, well, the. Um, Just curious how they compare quality. I think uh, this is for. This, this is 3.2 microns. And this, like, later on, like, you, you, may, you saw the 1 microns. Um, I think um, our data is uh, concerned with the 3.2 microns. We didn't, I, like, my results are not related with the micro, like, one micron. We just played with it and tried this. Uh, we also tried uh, trapping uh, uh, cells from onions. Uh, it was very fun to play with, uh, but unfortunately we couldn't get any like, uh, valuable quantitative results there. So even though it's quite a lot of fun, we have some clips, uh, it's not worth for this presentation, which concentrates on the KB. Yeah.